Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of March 29th, 2023. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I'm calling at 7.07 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. This planning board meeting is being held in person in the town room at town hall. However, this is a hybrid meeting. Members of the planning board and members of the public are also able to attend via Zoom. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by chapter 22 of, by chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022 and extended again by the state legislature on July 16th, 2022, the planning board has been given authority to hold meetings via Zoom. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. In-person attendance of the public is permitted at tonight's meeting. However, there is limited capacity in the town room due to the COVID pandemic. The capacity of the town room is limited to 40 people, including the planning board members and planning staff. Every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, please answer affirmatively whether you are participating remotely or in person. Bruce Coldham. Bruce is apparently not on the Zoom call and he's not in the town room, so he's not present. Tom Long. Present. Tom is present in the town room. Andrew McDougall. Present in the town room. I, Doug Marshall, am present in the town room. Janet McGowan, we have been notified, is absent this evening. Johanna Newman also is absent. Karen Winter. Present in the town room. Thank you all. If any technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If dis discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. For those participating remotely, please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. Planning board members who are present in the town room should also raise their hands when they wish to speak and the microphone will be passed to you, to you. The general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting if determined appropriate by the chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment or clicking the, click the raise hand button when public comment is solicited or raise your hand if you are present in the town room. If you have joined the town, the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with the guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. Uh, and I would like to uh, amend the roll call to state that during uh, the, the, the last initial comments I've made, Bruce Coldham has arrived and is sitting in the town room with the rest of us. So welcome, Bruce. Okay, so the time is 7.12. The first item on our agenda is public comment. Do we have any members of the public who wish to make a comment? Okay, we have one member of the public in the town room and she would like to make a comment. Uh, here's a microphone, which should go green, yep. And please state your name and your address at the beginning of your remarks. Uh, we don't have our usual stopwatch. It's okay, I don't think I'll take three minutes. 
Maura Keen, uh, 25 Dennis Drive. And I just, when I was thinking about your topic for tonight of um, where to put more housing for Amherst, I thought about, you know, we always talk about housing for families. And when I thought about me, when I had a small kids or I work with ACLT and the last family we put has three small children. They were in an affordable unit at Aspen, the new one, Aspen Heights. And it, it really didn't work out for them because the kids made too much noise and the neighbors complained. There was not enough room for the kids to run around. So I really ought to, I really think that when we plan um, denser housing, we ought to take that into account that people need space. They can't all be stacked together unless they're young single people. Um, or in dorms. And um, that's just, I think most people who live in Amherst don't want to live in an urban area and that's what they want for their living situation. So. Thank you, Mara. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have two members of the public. Uh, who are participating remotely. I see Jennifer Taub and Pamela Rooney, both of whom are town councilors. And I believe Pam is the liaison to the planning board at the moment. Okay, so the time now is 7.14 and we'll go to item two on our agenda, planning for housing and other growth. Planning board members to discuss opportunities for development of housing and other types of development in Amherst East Amherst Village Center, review zoning map and other maps as necessary and discuss potential locations. So with that, um, we can start. Uh, I'll remind the planning board members when you wanna speak, try to raise your hand. Somebody will hand you one of the two microphones we have and we can go from there. Anybody wanna start? I know, uh, I guess it was after the last in-person meeting we had just about a month ago, uh, Tom Long and I had a, one conversation by phone and kind of thought about, talked a little bit about uh, where we thought that the zoning could maybe go a little bit higher. And I think we, we mostly talked about the commercial area um, and, through the intersection of Southeast Street and I guess Belchertown Road or College Street and uh, out Belchertown Road to about the Eastern end of the loop for the Aspen Heights or Village or whatever Aspen, whichever Aspen project is along there. Is it Alpine? Al Alpine Commons, okay. Okay, so we, th we thought maybe that was far enough to think about. Um, I will, I mean, since, since I have the mic and, and nobody else is, is raising their hand, um, I made a couple of notes about the, the commercial zone because I hadn't really, we haven't really dealt with commercial zones very much on the planning board in the last, during the time I've been here for the last couple of years. Um, so as a kind of follow up to the, some of the things that Tom and I talked about, um, com mixed use buildings are allowed in the commercial zone um, by site plan review. Um, currently the commercial zone has a three story, 35 foot height limit. And, and then, um, if, if we were, you know, if we wanted to do something to try to encourage housing to, to happen along there, there is a 4,000 square foot incremental lot requirement for each additional unit on that, on that, uh, in, in that zone. And uh, I think the initial minimum lot size is 20,000 square feet, which is about a half an acre. Um, Sure, sure, Tom, thanks for suggesting. So um, the commercial zone, 
that we were that, that I guess I'm talking about yeah, is along College Street. It starts roughly at South Whitney, where that intersects College Street and extends east uh, through the intersection with Southeast Street. And then goes a little bit farther east, you know, a few hundred feet down Belchertown Road. Um, just to the, uh, along Southeast Street, uh, just to the south of that zone, there is, I think is that a village center? Yeah, village center business zone. And just to the north of it, there's a, along Southeast Street, there is a residential village center zone. Um, a little bit west of Southeast Street, there is a, another little commercial strip that's sort of buried inside of the, of the block. Um, and I, I think I was puzzled by why that was. Um, Chris, if you have any idea of the history of that little piece of commercial zoning that's uh, orphaned, you know, kind of in the middle of the block behind the north of the commercial. Um, right there. And if you really, if you, I'll give you the microphone if you want it. We have uh, two town councilors who are attending. Yep, and I don't know if Andrew has the technology. So Andrew is, is going to try to bring the town zoning map up on the screen. Uh, Bruce has his hand up. Do you want to, can I give you a mic? Filling in a little bit here, I just thought it might be worth mentioning, as far as I can see, there are only four commercial zones in town, and two of them would seem to me to be more or less what we might call spot zoned. One of them probably down, is it the Wentworth? Anyway, it's, it's two of them are very small. They seem to be like parcels that, well, spot zoned. So there's only two that are substantial. One of them is the one we're discussing, and the other one is essentially in North Amherst, substantially the Coles uh, property and the Puffer uh, property along uh, Old Sunderland Road. So those are, if we're talking about any zoning changes related to commercial or any changes related to commercial, it might be helpful for us to recognize that there's essentially only two of consequence. Thank you, Bruce. Um, Tom, did you want to say something? Okay. Yeah, I think when Tom and I were talking, we wondered about an overlay and rather than changing the commercial, um, that would certainly allow us to be more spe specific about where the, the uh, impacts were of whatever we were talking about. Tom. Yeah, I was just gonna say, we were also mentioning um, something that I think was brought up several times was finding a distance from the street that would be allowable as part of that overlay so that you know, there could be smaller things behind it, but we could think about how we want to densify Route 9 um, along that specific section rather than have it be a huge swath of land, but it could be just the way the commercial district right now um, in that zone is maybe 100 feet back on either side. So it has a, it's like a controlled zone along Route 9 on College Street. So if we can continue that down, it might have less of an impact on some of the developments that are around there, but actually add some density to the street uh, itself. Bruce, and then Andrew, you had briefly raised your hand. Oh, hold on. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pam. We need to be more speaking directly into the microphone okay. than we have been. So like that, Pam? 
Okay. Um, I was just observing, I think, to understand what you were saying, Tom, that, that many of the properties currently along that strip, that commercial strip, have parking in front. So you were talking about trying to uh, get the building line closer to the street. Is that, is, is the setback, I don't, I'm not familiar enough with the setback, is the setback driving it back or is it simply the decision to put parking in front? The setback is only, I think it's, is it 10? Okay, so it's a design decision. Well, the basic minimum front setback in commercial is 20 at the moment. The side and rear is 25, although that has footnote A, so that could be waived. Um, the maximum building coverage is 35% and the maximum lot coverage 70%. Uh, Karen, Karen, I have, here's the microphone. So I'm, I'm wondering, does that include the sidewalk, the setback that you're talking about, 20 feet? Is, where's the sidewalk? Uh, the setback is measured, I believe, from the property line. And sometimes the sidewalk may be inside the property or it may be outside the property, and that varies around town. Uh, Chris. I just wanted to say that the zoning of this area is very old. It really complies with the way people looked at things back in the 50s and 60s and maybe the 70s, and it was all highway strip. And that's why the parking is in front of the buildings and not in back. And people never thought of this as being a walkable village center until after that time. Um, and the sidewalk would be in the town right of way in this location. Thank you, Chris. I'm gonna ask you one other question. Uh, Janet had forwarded us the housing production plan, I believe, from several years ago, a few, and suggested we look at a few pages that were specific to this area, and I think in, uh, around Pomeroy. Um, when I looked at the housing production plan suggestions or you know vision for that for this area, they actually kept the one-story commercial buildings along the front along the street. And then they had behind it multi-story housing uh, that was more adjacent to the adjacent residential zone. Any idea why they didn't build up the, the area along the main street as opposed to farther back? I don't really know, but I think right now um, we would welcome having taller buildings along the street. We're trying to make that into a walkable village center. So pulling the buildings forward and then having parking behind and having a nice streetscape in front of the buildings is what we in the planning department would like to see happen. Okay, thank and you. May I also say that I think we might look at the commercial zoning district as being kind of archaic and that um, the business village center is really more in keeping with what our vision of the village center is. So the fact that that whole area is commercial, maybe we wanna consider or you wanna consider um, changing that to BBC rather than commercial. So one of the things I noticed about the, the commercial zone was that it allows a very wide variety of uses, mostly by site plan review. Is it true that the commercial zone allows a wider variety of uses than the, the business village center? Uh, Chris. I think that it may allow more things like automotive uses, although I'm not, I'm, I haven't looked at that recently, but there are several automotive uses that are in that area now, but those wouldn't have to go away if the zoning were to change. If those things were no right. longer allowed in the new zone, if they're already existing, they would be allowed to continue to exist. And they could also make improvements to their property because we have that section 9.22 of the zoning bylaw that allows changes to be made to non-conforming buildings and properties. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you a follow-up question. If the owner of that land decided, oh, I wanna tear down the, the, the building I have and put up different building on it with, it, with um, but I wanna have the same auto body shop that's there now, you know, go away for two years and then while I build my new building and come back, is that allowed or would they, if it's a new building, it's gonna be brand new zoning and nothing's grandfathered in. So 
the use can be grandfathered for as long as two years. That's what I understand. So if you went away for two years and then tried to come back, that would be diff difficult. But if you went away for a shorter amount of time, I think that could happen. Okay, so it, great, thank you. Andrew. Thanks, Doug. Um, so I actually would you, yes, thank you. Chris, what you had, what you had mentioned was actually something I was wondering as well. As, any reason why this would need to stay commercial. If we think of this end state, I don't know that any of us would really consider it to be commercial. And for the sake of simplification, it would seem like a logical thing to change. Um, I was also curious, and I'm kicking myself for not having my laptop here, as to um, the extent of the, I believe it's probably Amherst College property on the south side of College Street. Um, how far west can this reasonably be developed? Yeah, so I mean, right, seeing the um, kind of the cross hatch on here, it looks like to, to South Whitney Street. Is the zone, are those actual parcels that could be developed? So this kind of south side of South Whitney here. It's very wet there. Um, all of that Amherst College property is very wet. And I think these, this might be the Port River auto body. I'm not uh, sure. I don't think okay. so. I think that's up further because okay. that's South Whitney there. All right. Okay. I see. Yeah. So I don't know what that is. Maybe that's just some residential buildings, but all of this is very wet. You can see it yeah. when you drive by. It's really flat. I've, 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 I've walked through that. I know, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, the other thing I was just going to mention going into this as well is that you know I think it's appropriate that we're approaching this from a residential perspective, but I think it's also important for us to keep in mind the commercial and, and retail that we want, like for build this out successfully, we really need to have the supporting retail base. Um, otherwise it's frankly, it may just be like more apartment complexes in this area that we want this to be a functioning village center. I think the pieces are there. Um, let's just, let's not lose sight of that, right? That um, we wanna have something that combines the two uh, I think that's it for now. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, I, I guess I, uh, we wouldn't want to, I would agree, we wouldn't want to do anything that drove these kinds of businesses out of town, um, particularly because we have such a small commercial tax base to start with. Um, Andrew. Thanks again. Um, that's actually something I had heard just in a conversation with someone uh, last week is that um, the town is in sort of great need of some additional revenue. And, you know, we've got a school vote coming up. It, you know, we can't continue to, to, to ask, um, you know, residential property owners to carry that burden. Um, this is such a, to me, this is such a logical place for us to try to focus our efforts and build this out where we can get some diversity in that revenue stream. It's, you know, there's, there's benefit not only for the folks who live in this community, but for the town itself, if we can get some additional um, forms of revenue to come in. Thanks. Uh, Chris. So mixed use buildings and apartment buildings do pay taxes. And I think they pay taxes um, based on what their income is, rather than, you know, their not actual on the value. Assessed value. I don't think so. Or okay. if it is, it's related. It's also related to the revenue that they bring in, the um, rent that they charge. So that's something I learned that I wasn't uh, clear about. But um, that that means that when you build a mixed use building or an apartment building, you're not uh, you're not losing revenue. Right, and you're in, you're increasing the number of residential units in town. So whatever. So there is some t increase in taxes that way too, Karen. Um, so the dilemma is how to uh, keep businesses from getting crowded out because if it's only if you're if it's the highest bidder probably at the moment uh, a big residential building is going to be able to make more profit than a little business and we would lose these little businesses so we have to be you know we have to be wise about how we're going to do this. Bruce? Um, I'm mindful of what uh, I heard um, Nate say last time we did this, which is that it was the, uh, and it probably varies obviously from parts of town, 
but and he was probably talking about the downtown and this is close but not exactly downtown but what he said was that it was the uh, residential income that was driving the properties and that the uh, uh, that the uh, landowners could afford to carry the commercial space on the first floor or the retail space, the, the, the non-residential zone on the first floor. Um, to the extent that that's true and to the extent that that's true here, uh, here being the, uh, the strip of commercial, uh, I think we're talking about essentially single story res uh, retail establishments there. Um, uh, the, if one, it would seem that to encourage uh, the preservation of that single story business activity with uh, with residential on the upper on upper floors would uh, increase the the value uh, the income generating capabilities of properties along that street. Um, of course. For me, always the uh, the magic question is how do you provide, how do you induce uh, people who own these places to take risks um, or to match a vision that we may or anyone may have that's not them? I don't think that's not. I don't think that's impossible, but it, it certainly is a, a challenge that we have to recognize. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Chris, uh, you, I we see your hand. I understand from talking to a representative of the uh, of the Shumway family that they are interested in taking a risk with their property, which is on College Street. It's the property that includes um, the paint store. Oh, it's not a paint store. It's a flooring store. Oh, the Summerlin. Summerlin. Flooring okay. store and mom's house and that whole area. So they're interested in creating a mixed use building in that location. I'm not sure what plans they had for their um, commercial tenants, but they can't do what they want to do with the current zoning. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing I wondered about was maybe increasing the allow the number of stories or height, but in this zone, insisting on 100% commercial on the first floor, rather than downtown where we've allowed a, a minimum of 30% has to be non-residential. I mean, we could propose that we could it could get enacted and we could see if anybody finds that economically feasible. But that would be a way to sort of try to preserve the commercial, uh, you know, some of the businesses that are there, you know, at least they don't get whittled down in terms of the square footage. There's no way to know whether the rent might increase uh, if they were in a new building. So uh, I see Andrew's hand and then Karen's hand. I think we just would need to offer up more height in exchange, right? So like, if we're going to say that, you know, for, for an economically viable product, a project, they need three stories of residential. If we say the ground floor has got to be commercial, then we let them go up four stories, right? right? So that they can, they can still, I mean, we, we need to make sure that, that it's, um, uh, we need to we need to make sure that we can still um, provide opportunities for private investors to make that leap. And if we want them to take an avenue that doesn't allow them to maximize their profits, then we need to give them some other avenues to make it enticing for them to, to come in. And it would seem to me like I would certainly have no problem with going taller uh, along College Street at all. I mean, if, if we can get development close to the street, get the, the ground floor retail activated, and give them the opportunity to get housing. We're trying to get housing anyway, right? So um, I'd say I, I'd be more than happy to trade off going vertical to, to enable that. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Andrew. I see Karen and then Bruce. So I, the danger is that uh, with one of these new constructions, the rent in the commercial space kind of rules out all the mom and pop shops that we love in Amherst and want to keep and the ones that are there now like like moms and this paint show. Um, the the commercial space is going vacant in a lot of places because I don't know is it the rent or is it the design again is also so conducive to something like what we have the insurance companies 
but where is the knitting shop? Where, is, where are these shops that we really need in a small town like Amherst to make it continue to be a historic, attractive town? How do we do that? Can we demand that uh, these places be designed in a certain way and that the rent be small? Can we demand that it's a kind of a, uh, maybe a conglomerate where you have booths in there, a chocolate or a cheese place, a fish place, you know, that they can share it. Somehow we have to, we have to be careful because we don't want more of these empty, big commercial spaces. Uh, Bruce, do you still want to be next? Yes. Um, I'm reminded of uh, when I was uh, co-chair of the first time we not the first time, but the first time in the most recent round of master planning um, in the uh, around 2000 or so, in the late 90s, 2000s. Um, one of the topics of conversation at that time was the, the, uh, the, the entry experience into the town. And we, th we thought about the various ways that people came into town, the, the routes and so forth. And the one that seemed to be most troublesome not, not most troublesome, but at least inspiring, certainly, was this uh, Route 9 from this direction. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's uninspiring for the greater portion of its length. So we're not going to solve this problem, uh, if it's a problem, I think it is, um, quickly. But what you were saying, Andrew, I think, uh, or maybe it was Tom, about uh, accepting height in this, uh, in this location we're discussing, I think that would be a, a, a significant step forward to defining an entry um, uh, in, in, into town. And so, whereas height has had problems for certain people downtown where they were overwhelming, so sidewalks and residential experience and so forth, I think here, uh, we would try and improve the residential experience, uh, the, the, the pedestrian experience, I'm, I'm, I'm meaning to say. But I think here, um, some heights that define the road and define a kind of a beginning of an entry up to the center of town would actually be a very constructive thing. So I would, so I would personally encourage any kind of initiative that included that sort of thing in the development. Thank you, Bruce. Tom? Thank you. Yeah, and Bruce, I think one of the things I just brought up on the screen was that um, what Doug and I were discussing was bringing that zone, which is now commercial, which we're thinking about as a residential village center or commercial village center, however we want to think about it, coming around this corner and actually moving further down Route 9 uh, due to the fact that we do have a lot of, um, let's call them, student dwellings that are these conglomerate houses that have been broken down um, that I'm sure not broken down in a negative way, but broken down into units, uh, not run down, but, but yes. Multi-unit. Multi-unit that run all along. And this would be the east side of Belchertown Road. So, you know, those are opportunities for growth, for density. And, and we know that some of those developments are coming um, and some of those properties, at least to some degree, um, but also thinking about bringing commercial down this way, which is something we talked about last time, whether those are grocery stores or other kinds of smaller um, outlets. And, and Karen, you know, I think if there are more shops, they're likely to be more affordable than if there's just one building with three really important, I mean, I think that's what happened downtown is that those are prime real estate downtown and became very pricey. Whereas a, a large volume of smaller commercial spaces along this area might have a slightly different value than they would downtown. So it might be more affordable for some people if we have more of them um, all the way down this strip of road here. So our question was how far down do we go and how do we consider the extension of that zone around the corner here? Andrew, or Chris, do you need to respond to that? Or I do was you want just going to mention the fact that we have a development coming in on the east side, side of Belchertown Road that is the Wayfinders development. And I think that's 
three stories, if I'm not mistaken. So that's going to be an imposing presence on Beltry Town Road. Where, where exactly is that? That is just beyond the, let's see, the center of this uh, picture right there. here. There's um, a building with a white roof, and it's right there, yeah. And just to the east of that or southeast of that is the property that's going to be transformed into um, multifamily housing by way. So it's on the north side. Northeast side of Belgium. North, yeah. Road. Yeah. And it's all. It's it, going to be towards the road. We asked to have it pulled towards the road. So it's not quite as far as Colonial Village. Right. Okay. And then there's another one that Amir McChee is planning to build on the south side of Southeast Street or the southeast side of Southeast Street, um, right in back of Auto Express. Okay. He's proposing to build, I think, well, I'm, I don't really know how many units, but I believe that's he's trying to get a four-story building in there, and it's going to be, he's, he's proposing mixed use. And that's in the uh, Village Center yeah, business CBC, zone. Yeah. Yeah. And he does have retail space in his building across the street, which the planning board approved a few years ago. The one ago. that's been under construction. Yeah, so he will have six small spaces in there. And I don't know what he has in mind for that, but that's an, a location for okay. some potential retail. Great. Uh, Andrew. Thanks, Doug. Um, a couple of thoughts. I am, I'm all in favor of extending this, uh, this you know, business village center down Belchtown Road. Um, I think um, Bruce's point on this being a gateway is a very good one. You know, I, when I approach, I typically think of the gateway as sort of Southeast in the Cumberland Farm, Southeast Street, right? You come around the corner and then here you are presented with uninspiring stuff, but like that's sort of the, the entry point. Mm -hmm. um, so this would give us an opportunity to extend the zoning. It actually gives us an opportunity to redefine the gateway into town, right? We can push it back and we can, we can actually try to, um, we can, we can try to curate that to a certain extent, um, which, is a, which is a marvelous opportunity. And I think a, a wonderful byproduct of this is, is allowing us to redefine that. I wanted to, to go back um, also, Karin, one of the things that your comments made me, reminded me of was what Kyle, one of the presentations- Kyle Wilson of Archipelago. Kyle, Archipelago. You know, as, as we're talking about this, it's some of the same uh, conversations that we had for downtown. And he was, he was indicating that just how very difficult it is to get those small retailers in um, based on the economic profile of what he could build. And so I think we have, to, we have to realize that if we want those small businesses, and I think everybody does, is we need to give developers an opportunity to subsidize that by giving them more residential so that they can offer, essentially, they need to, to get those retailers, they're, they're going to need to, to offer below market rents. I don't think there's, you know, from what and Kyle said, I don't know. Whether it's below market, it, it's at least below the actual cost of building space right now. Uh, absolutely. It's, okay. it's, it's something with, they would need to subsidize. And I think for us to, to expect them to carry that, then, you know, we need to offer them something in return. That's why I was, I was proposing, you know, going higher, going taller so that they can get more, re more residential to subsidize that. So yeah, two points. One, again, Kyle, I think someone who's very vested in this, indicating how difficult it is to get small retailers, even downtown, maybe more difficult, I'm not sure, uh, out in one of the village centers. Um, and then, yeah, to just echo what I heard from Tom and you, Doug, in terms of your earlier conversations, wrapping this, extending the business village center, I think at least to Colonial Village, maybe, and I always forget the name of the, that, uh, that, that uh, organic store, Maplewood, Maple, thank you. Maplewood. Yeah, you know, maybe even go further to Maplewood. Um, wonderful opportunity for us to redefine the gateway, um, you know, set this out to, be be something that's really uh again kind of a, a curated design as opposed to just something that haphazardly developed through you know zoning that's years old and so forth thanks okay thanks karen did you want to say something can can i say one thing before you do um my experience with for instance my tailor who is in you know 
yeah. who shortens my pants because nobody makes pants that length. Um, it's a it's a single immigrant Russian woman down in South Amherst, right near Pomeroy, uh, the intersection with Pomeroy, and she's in a pretty nondescript little commercial strip that's kind of across from the Moan and Duff, but that's not new space, you know. And I think I've my experience is that the people who, for for instance, I don't know what it, I don't remember what it was called, but that hotel that was where Eleven East Pleasant Street went, where where the music store was and the uh, maybe the knitwear was there, but the carriage shops, that's right. The carriage shops, you know, that was a 1950s hotel, slowly depreciated, probably no mortgage. And it was, you know, they could rent that at $15 a square foot rather than the going, what you need now, which is like probably 30 or 35 to break even on building something. So, I think that those kinds of businesses end up being in the older uh, buildings that are more depreciated and the mortgage is, you know, was, was done in 1970 and the dollars were fewer. And so, I mean, I just feel like it's hard to get those kinds of relatively, I don't want to use the word marginal, but they're low, they're, they're low revenue businesses, it's hard to put them into a new building, just generally. And they tend to end up in the older buildings on the edge of whatever the redevelopment is happening. So that's what I wanted to say, Karen. Right, but, but we're displacing them too by saying, we're gonna tear this down and put something else and we can't displace all these little places. It's gonna destroy our, a lot of, of town. So we have to, there, do we have the power to do things to say, okay, you can go forth, you're going to make your money on the residential, but it's a requirement that you have low rent for the, or, or you design it so that it's small. Do we have that kind of power? Other thing that I want to ask is if they're going to build something like this, four stories, it might be really profitable for them. Can we demand that they also put some money into a fund for bicycling or public transportation into town. I mean, if we're a planning committee and we want to go in this direction, what power do we have? We've got to steer development in that uh, direction. And it might be a stick and a carrot kind of an approach. So I, I have one, to respond to your second topic. I was looking at the Arlington zoning code recently, and they have a whole section on bicycles. And the required bicycle indoor and outdoor, uh, you know, storage areas that are required for a whole slew of different building types. And I, you know, I, I kind of wondered if I had a few extra hours, whether I should just copy it and bring it in. And, you know, we could mold it to something that's applicable to our town and add a bicycle section where we've got a parking section now. Um, so that's something that we could do. Um, Personally, I find the financial levers that you're talking about more difficult. I think they're more difficult. I could be wrong, but um, all right. Any other hands at the moment? People want, yep, Karen. So I guess somebody has to research whether this is done anywhere. And I'm willing to try to do that. Uh, there must be it, precedents. It, it sounds like it's kind of like an affordable housing requirement, right. but, but for affordable commercial. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and there, uh, because you know, if if we were, if we were Aspen or a place like that, there would be the kind of rich companies that come and make small little places, but we're a college town, um, and we don't cater to only wealthy people. So we have to have a different kind of a, an approach so that we can have these kinds of um, retail that we need. Uh, Bruce, I think, wanted to go next. Yeah, I'm just thinking a little further uh, uh, along with what Karen was saying about... Um, uh, in, into the microphone, Bruce. Yes. Uh, Sam's having a hard time. Gener generating... Uh, 
um, uh, causing uh, um, developers to put into put money into a pot of some sort. Um, I've often thought that in parts of town where it's not possible to provide parking because there's no room, um, it would seem to me to be quite reasonable that uh, um, developers would contribute to a fund that would be um, creating a parking garage somewhere that would be of consolidated benefit to the to the total surrounding. So in principle, that doesn't seem unreasonable. And I think we could probably find examples of where that's been done. I, I expect that all of these things are kind of difficult to do. Um, and there's probably all sorts of reasons why it might not be a good idea, but there's probably a few that would suggest that it would be. So then we just uh, move laterally from that to say, well, what other things uh, might we um, what other in, what other incentives or whatever the word is for these things that we might invent that would uh, allow us to subsidize support or construct other things as a consequence or as a product of the uh, uh, some other inducements we might put to a, a to a in, in the in the bylaw that would says well we can do something bigger closer whatever 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 is in whatever is in demand, we look at it and we think, well, how can we satisfy, how can we feed, how, how can we move toward that demand and what can we get back? And then how can we use what we get back? Um, it's a very broad sense of strategically, but uh, it does seem to me that uh, um, at some point we're going to be moving in that direction because we're, 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 we're constantly scraping the barrel, you know. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, yeah. <coughs> oh, Nate, Nate, uh, you want to talk? Oh, sure. So I guess a few things I was thinking about listening to you is, um, you know, down on the Route 9, I feel like it's a great place for a 40-hour zone, right? So we tried it in the downtown. It didn't work because we had allowed almost a complete build-out in the BG. But right now, there's talking about zoning those areas. 40R would get affordable units, we could control design and essentially can bypass zoning because if they opt in to use the 40R with the increased density and other things, it might be an incentive to do that. So I guess that was one that I had. Um, and the other one was I want to lose sight of having a student housing zone. So I think it's good to look at village centers. I also think that, I mean, Let's talk about having a student housing overlay, perhaps around the UMass campus, you know, on the old gateway sites. And you know, let's look at both of those. So let's try to do um, student housing to help balance the housing equation. And then also, where, how can we help our village centers? Um, Nate, you were a little bit difficult to understand, but as I understand it, you were talking about a student housing overlay district somewhere in town or in this particular area and a 40R zone in this area. Is that correct? Right, so 40R along Route 9. Okay, so there have been discussions about, say, changing to say like BBC or upzoning it, but I think that... Okay. So maybe we'll need to get a little more clarity from you at the next regular planning board meeting when maybe the audio will be better. Right. You're def yeah, you're definitely, I think we all understood you were talking about a 40 hour zone along Route 9. And the, the student housing overlay, I'm a little unclear about right now. Closer to the university? Okay, all right, thank you, Tom. Andrew. Thanks, Doug. That was actually a nice reminder, Nate. I remember when we were talking about 40R, um, at the time, it had popped in my mind as well that maybe one of the village centers would be a better candidate for that, knowing that there was so much sensitivity to uh, how we manage downtown. So I, I need to dust off my notes, but I think it's absolutely something that would be worth looking at. And then also, I, I know they're very difficult I mean, that's about all I know about them, but enterprise zones, is that something like, 
we were that that was I think being used to develop some of the Coles um, properties in North Amherst. Is 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 there an opportunity? Again, I I know very very little about those, uh, but is there an opportunity to try to leverage enterprise um, uh, zone concept here? My recollection of the enterprise zone is that that's a federally designated area of town, which is an hour one enterprise zone is in North Amherst, and it does include Coles. Yes. Um, and so, but beyond that, I don't know anything oh, about yeah, them. <laughs> I don't think there's a restriction to the number of them, um, as, as far as I understand, that there could be more. I think that it was designated, you know, intended for low and moderate income census tracts. This may not qualify. Um, so there may be some some restrictions, but knowing that those, you know, those enterprise zones might, maybe there's some opportunity to leverage that uh, to help drive incentives as well. Uh, Chris. I think there are some different things um, to look at. Enterprise zones are one thing, but I think what we have in North Amherst is actually called an opportunity zone. And that okay. is a designated federal zone. Um, I think we're kind of perhaps too far into the time period during which that could happen. It started a number of years ago, and I think there was a 10-year time period when you could take advantage of it. Nate actually knows more about that than I do, and unfortunately, his audio isn't working very well. But at the next meeting, he might be able to enlighten us about the opportunity zone in North Amherst. But I, I have a feeling we're a little bit late for that one. Okay. Enterprise zones, we do have other enterprise zones around town. There was one that was created, I believe, in the, in East Amherst, in the vicinity of the um, PRP zoning district, where Ron Liberty owns some property. And um, another, and I think there was one created in, or maybe it's that Ron keeps talking about it, wanting to have an enterprise zone there. There is one in um, South Amherst at Atkins Farm. I do know about that one. So that's something that we could look into to try to make that happen again. But those kind of require, I think they require an economic development committee of some sort to, to run them, to operate them. Okay. But it, that's a possibility. Okay. Yeah. And, and the, the opportunity zone, which was part of the tax act, we, we have the one we have to create more would require another act of Congress. Right. Okay. All right. All right, the time is about eight o'clock. Uh, we did start at seven, so I don't know that we need to take a break at our usual eight o'clock time tonight. There does seem to be a little bit of a lull in the raising of the hands. Karen, what's that? Uh, hold on a second, Karen. Um, do we have any hands raised, Pam, in the attendees? All right. Um, members of the public, there are two of you. Do you, three, there's one here in the room. Um, do any of you want to make a comment in this discussion? Okay, I see one hand from, I saw one hand from Jennifer Taub, but it went away. So maybe she thought better of it. All right, it's up again. So Jennifer, we'll move you to where you, we can allow you to talk and give us your name and your street address at the beginning. Yeah, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Jennifer. Okay. I don't know why the hand went up and down. Uh, Jennifer Taub, 259 Lincoln Avenue. Um, I am speaking as a resident. Um, and I did, I just wanted to ask, because I did think I heard Nate, although it was muffled. Um, I don't know if Karin heard the same, we're neighbors. Um, did he mention the gateway as a location possibly for student housing? And I guess what would concern me is they're currently putting up, I don't know, again, if this would be considered the gateway where the new student housing complex is going on Lincoln and Mass Avenue. But um, there are 800 students, 600 of whom are undergraduates moving basically on to you know a residential street um so i would hope we're not looking at jumping into more 
housing, big large student housing complexes there because it really is um, on the rim of a residential neighborhood. And I think we'd kind of be blasted away. So I, I just wanted to ask, um, maybe um, Chris knows if that's something that's you know being thought about. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I certainly, I did not hear Nate use the word gateway, but I could be wrong. I don't know if Nate used that word or not, but I know for a long time, um, there has been the idea floating around of having some sort of student housing district close to the university in the vicinity of Fearing Street and Phillips Street. Now that's an idea that's been talked about ever since I got here, which was 20 years ago. And I think it was talked about before that. So it's not something that's new. It's not something that is actually being worked on, but it's an idea that is um, often resurrected. And I think Nate is resurrecting that idea as an obvious place to have a student zoning district if we were going to have one. Okay. It's right close to yep. the university. Well, that certainly was one of the three areas that the U3 consultant that did the sort of study of where public private partnerships might happen that has resulted, you know, one of the three areas that they recommended for was where the housing is going now that the university is building. And then the second one was in, in that area along Triangle or North Pleasant Street that has traditionally been called the gateway. And then the third one, I think, was down off of University Drive opposite the Southwest dorms uh, on the west side of University Drive. So obviously the university decided to go with one of those and um, hasn't decided to go with others. But there, there certainly is some public land on the southwest side of North Pleasant Street as you go up toward the university. Uh, Chris, then Andrew. Oh, I was just gonna say that most of that land between the Baptist Church and the center of town is all private land so the university only controls gordon hall and crotty hall or on that some, side of the degree. street but on the opposite on the other side, side of the street the, where those you have the old fraternity properties that's right right yes. that yeah. that long lawn yeah uh is university property yeah. too andrew is it university or is it owned by the fraternities the lawn where yeah. the old frats were yeah is I owned thought. by the university okay now. okay um on that just on that point uh to me like University Drive is such a logical spot for it, um, and I you could I could en envision like just a it, a separate type of village center being built out there with you know the land that I think the question I would have for folks and I mentioned this I think last time as well is with the town line you know we're, we're trying to solve our housing we're trying to you know keep um, keep these folks out of our neighborhood. Or I'm, you know, hearing that there's interest in uh, not having student housing really overwhelm the residential, residential, existing residential neighborhoods. Is would we be comfortable if that all ended up in Hadley or on university property where we get no revenue from it? Um, uh, kind of unrelated, but um, I can't remember how I got thinking about this. But um, Chris, you'd mentioned back to sort of East Amherst here the wet um, property kind of on the south, are there, are there some uh, environmental concerns that we need to consider if we want to build more density in this general area? Um, on the north side, certainly on the south, it sounds like there might be, but is there, are there some potential um, limitations that might prevent us from really moving forward with building density here? Thanks. Uh, Chris, if you know anything about those issues. Are you talking about the area at the intersection of Dickin Dickinson and, oh, just the commercial area along College Street? I would say that drainage is probably going to be an issue there. Um, other than that, I I'm not aware of any big environmental issues. Okay. I know that the issues down where University Drive is, that, that, opposite southwest that's essentially the bottom of lake hitchcock and so it has lots of organics and the soil is not very good for foundations so you have to go deep and it goes expensive and um 
So this area is obviously up the hill. Um, it's actually up the hill and then back down into a, another floodplain. But um, I don't know what the, anything about the geotechnical. Uh, we, we had one more public person who wanted to make a comment. Maura, Maura Keen. Yeah, it just it makes me kind of nervous when you talk about those one story shops on the one story stores on College Street, because those are all pretty viable businesses. I use them all. And when Kelly's went, when he retired, it got bought right away. Um, and I just think of what happened to the carriage shops. Well, Amherst Wines and Spirits moved down there, but most of those stores went out of business and went out of town because they couldn't afford the new rents. So I think by allowing more development, it may just run those businesses out of town too and we'll be all the poorer for it, even if it is an ugly building. Thank you, Maura. All right, so Bruce. Um, just to add to what you said, Maura, I, I think it's probably not uh, just uh, the new property values and the rental increases that go with them, although that's clearly some part of it. But on the street and uh, that lower end of college that we're talking about, we've got Spirit House, for example. And my guess is, and I'm not a business uh, retailer, but my guess is that the problem there would be uh, the development period that also drives businesses away. They may be quite viable in the new location, but they can't be in the new location the next morning. There's a two year period. And that I think is at least as uh, damaging. So we could, we, we could address ourselves perhaps to that. I don't know, but those are the challenges I think associated with keeping businesses. Thank you, Bruce. Karen? Um, I think it's good if we try to stay concentrated on this, this east side a little bit. And one of the things that we all were concerned about is how to get a food retail grocery place in this part of town. Um, I wonder, Christine, what happened to Maplewood Farms? Is there any way to revitalize that? I never quite, is there a short way to answer that? The issue there is really zoning. And what they were allowed to do was to create a restaurant that was a farm stand restaurant. So they had to grow a certain amount of their things that they served and sold there on the land and also within Massachusetts. And they had a hard time meeting that. So they couldn't, they couldn't really establish a store where they could offer, you know, toilet paper and Lysol and things from Ohio and everywhere, you know, so it couldn't be a regular grocery store. It could only be a grocery store that was really a farm stand that was, you know, um, had, had things to offer that were local. And that was part of the zoning. Yeah, because, because it's in the you know, RN zoning district. Yeah. So that only allows the farm stand. It doesn't allow commercial use. So you'd have to change the zoning of the property in order to allow a grocery store to exist there. Right. And currently, grocery stores are allowed by site plan review in town in the BG, BL, BVC, BN, and COM. Okay. Um, Chris, why don't you hand the microphone to Bruce? Bruce has got his hand up. I remember the issue associated with uh, the Maplewood restaurant and so forth and the town meeting and, and the re reluctance to embrace what I guess was called spot zoning. And uh, because we, the town wasn't prepared to embrace a spot zone for that uh, location, uh, the, the business died. There may be other reasons that I'm not aware of, but that I think is certainly one of them. But as we noted, I noted earlier with the uh, commercial district, uh, there are four parts of the commercial zone in town and two of them uh, essentially spot zone. One of them is Amherst Farmers, which is a zone all by itself in the middle of the educational zone. And the other is um, 
leader or whatever, I don't know what it's now called, but the hardware store just on the uh, east side of the railway, that's the other spot zone. So we do spot zones. I, I don't see the downside of it. I wonder, Chris, whether you know why do we, do we still have this feeling that that maple, that product, that, that, that location couldn't be uh, zoned in a way that would make it, say, attractive to, uh, well, we've talked before about the, uh, the, the Amos Co-op. I, mean, I have no connection with the Amos Co-op at least none that's um, relevant here. And, uh, but it would seem like a, 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 that it should be on a short list of possible sites for that, uh, particularly as we've said earlier, that this is a, a kind of a food desert a bit down here. And, uh, and, and if we could attract that, uh, uh, that kind of business or even that particular business into this uh, location, I think it would, uh, it would, it would uh, move the ball forward in the way we've been discussing. So, if there's more than start zoning, we can talk about that. But but for the moment, is there any particular reason why we should not contemplate um, a similar kind of spot zoning to make it possible to do more on that site than you described earlier? Chris, you don't have to answer that if you don't want to. Well, I think that's one of the reasons why we're talking about um, stretching the zoning from the intersection of Belcher Town Road and Southeast Street East towards Maplewood Farm, because we wanted to include that in the village center. And I don't know if you could zone that particular property all by itself. I could ask KP Law. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Karen, you have your hand up. I propose that we ask KP Law whether we could spot zone Maplewood Farm and um, support the initiative to get that going. It really grates my sensitivities and everything else to go by it and see this beautiful place, which I remember visiting and having a wonderful time at, just molding away when we so desperately need something like that on that site. So I, yeah. Um. Andrew or Chris? Okay. I just wanted to say that we would need to get the owner of the property on board with this idea. So that would be like the first step that we'd have to take is to talk to him about whether he'd be interested in going ahead with this. Andrew? Thanks, Doug. Um, spot zone, or I mean, where would we? I mean, we could why, why not just move make the sure BBC. you include it? That's yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm just wondering. Um, and I'm trying to remember if that's adjacent to, if, if it's, it's before Stan or it's after Stanley, right? It's bef uh, so coming in, like, I guess, where would the logic, if, if we just extended this, I think we're, we're all comfortable with, um, well, yeah, I that. think, I think Alpine Commons, the Eastern end was, it was kind of where, uh, Tom and I had sort of ended it, but, it, and that's, you know, the next one down is the Maplewood area. And then that was kind of my point is I think I agree with you. Like I thought this would also be sort of Alpine Commons is like a logical spot, but maybe we just pull it a little bit further up and then um, we don't need spot zone. Right. Tom? And I think it also helps us think about this gateway that Bruce is bringing up because right before that, is a series of open land and farms and really quite beautiful landscape. And you start getting into the more dense housing and, and other things and actually spot housing that's happening around there. But that's also an opportunity to think about gateway signage into Amherst or however you want to call it. It's a really a nice spot moving from the open kind of farmland. Well, it's not really quite farmland, but there's the nursery on yeah, the side. Amherst nursery at um, the old fairgrounds. Yeah, and there's some some farms before that as well. Um, so I agree, I think pulling it down. The question was, um, Doug, in what you were saying a moment ago, is a supermarket not allowed in a... It's allowed in COM. It's but, allowed in v, P, BVC. Okay. And then, then it becomes a question of the maximum building coverage. Is that big enough? Is that right. a big enough footprint for a right. viable supermarket or not? Right. You know, I mean, you look at Stop and Shop and they have a particular <clears throat> footprint that they usually do. Yeah. Uh, big Y is smaller. Um, 
But I, mean, I think it's also possible to imagine a smaller grocery that even had residential on top of it. These aren't uncommon right. in a lot of places as well. So I you know, don't think we're thinking we need to stop and shop here per se either. I think there are lots of other ways. In between. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, we can kind of decide, you know, how, how much land there is and what what could happen if, if we zoned it that way and how big of a building you could put there. But um, but I do think it would be another opportunity for residential as well if people wanted to to capitalize on that land. Okay, Chris, did you have you want to say something? What did I want to say? I wanted to say that I think the co-op is a possibility for that property. I don't know if they have talked to the owner of that property, but that would take a rezoning to make that happen. But the co-op is currently um, an entity that is trying to create a grocery store of a sort, but it's not stop and shop. So I don't know if people would, I, I doubt that people would feel happy if a stop and shop went in that location, but they would potentially feel happy to have a, you know, a co-op store okay. go there. Nothing against stop and shop. <laughs> Tom. And I think I have questions about what our next steps are in terms of, okay, so if we, can all agree to some degree that there's needs to be a change in the comms district. It needs to, you know, we want to think about adding some density there. We want to think about um, how we can extend that further down the road. So what's our, what's, what's well, that I process think, look like? It, what do it, we need to, we need to walk I away with it, a drawing today? Like what, what's the, what's the process to get there? Well, we could come up with a drawing here, at least a boundary. Um, I think it would be the next step would probably be having either planning staff or a planning board member or members um, draft draft a, a zoning, you know, all change or overlay or what, however, whatever the strategy they wanted to do was. Um, I in the in the last regular planning board meeting which I think was the one that I had to leave early. There was some conversation about when we need open, when we need to comply with open meeting law and when we don't. And I, what I remember hearing in when I listened to the recording, it sounded like two members of the planning board who want to just go do something and talk to each other and prepare something for the board can do that without violating open meeting law when they work together. But if the planning board rec formally requests that members go and do something, then open meeting law extends to the work that those fewer than a quorum do. Uh, Chris, you're shaking your head up and down and you agree with my memory of that? Yes, if the planning board designates two members to go off and work on something, that, those two members become a subcommittee and then you have to post the meetings and be kind of formal about it. Yep. So there's nothing wrong with that. It's just more work. Right. You can't meet casually. But if two members decide to go off and do something on their own and they don't constitute a quorum, then they can bring their work product back to the planning board. Right. So okay. So and and then in terms of planning staff, I know you guys have been shorthanded for a couple of months at least. Um, when you and I have in, in some of our conversations about this, it sounded like you were thinking this was productive conversation, but it wasn't likely to be something that the planning staff could focus on a lot outside of this meeting for some time, because you've got some other, you know, we've got the, the duplex zoning that is, has been proposed and is, is being, I guess, discussed with town councilors. Um, and you, you know, You've been shorthanded, so you've got other committees you need to support. So it feels to me like, to answer your question, Tom, my, my answer would be if particular members want something to happen sooner rather than later, those members should initiate some work, whether they do it or they twist somebody else's arm to do it. And so that the fastest way would be for the planning board to come up with for somebody to show up, you know, at the planning board and say, hey, I've worked on this. What do you guys think? And then 
but if we want to have the planning staff support it, it's likely to be, it's not likely to be the top priority for some period of months. Uh, Chris, do you set? Yeah, I would say it's going to be some period of months because we just hired a new um, planning planner and he's one of two planners that we need to ful fulfill our staff. Um, so he's going to be, you know, getting on board. He's not up to speed today. He may be in a couple of months, and then we're going to hire somebody else who's also going to take time to come on board. So, and we also have two comprehensive permits that are coming before the Zoning Board of Appeals that are going to take a lot of effort. And we have two solar projects that are coming before the Zoning Board. So those are all things that are going to take a lot of focus from the planning staff. But this is a very good idea. And we have um, an indication from one of the property owners, the one in the uh, commercial section that they're interested in this. So I think it's certainly a worthwhile thing to work on. I believe that the building commissioner is interested in working on it too. So, you know, maybe by the end of the summer, we might be able to have some time to work on this. Okay, that would be my I guess. also yeah. see Nate's hand. Oh. Nate, you wanna try? Uh, Speaking to us again? Oh sure, I um I I switched computers, so I think the audio should be better. That you yeah. sound you sound much better already. Great, uh, Andrew. I was going to say, if you're on the property map right there, you can um, there's the dial the drop down box, so you can hit zoning map where it says property map up in the screen. There's a little dialog box next to the pan. Yeah, so if you hit that, the zoning will come up, and there's also the conservation trails and map. So it just show you know you can show it right there. Um, I was going to say I like the idea of looking at that this area for rezoning. I will. Hmm. I still like the idea of a 40R, in part because it has affordability and design guidelines. And I think whether or not we use a 40R, or if we go to something like BVC, I, I do think I would like to have a stronger design guidelines. So, you know, if things are going to be by site plan review, I'd like to have a little bit more in terms of, you know, what how we can um manage you know setbacks and building facades and other things so if we do want to have a nice feeling along the street you know some entryway gateway uh you know i think we need to encourage that so with with wayfinders on the belchertown road site you know because it's a comprehensive permit and it's a town partnership with them they're willing to to you know change the site design but that might not always be the case um the other thing i was going to say is Andrew, you're asking about south of College Street, if that could be densified, because it is commercial now, but I think honestly, all of that will be would be considered wetland. And so I'm not sure that where there's a commercial district right now, that any of that is actually build is really is really buildable. I, I, I think, you know, we could zone it knowing that maybe there's a potential, but I, I have a feeling that if someone were to go out there and do some checking, I, I feel like it would probably be considered all wetland. Just we can do if you do the conservation trails map, it shows you some of the conservation layers, uh, like mass um, natural heritage, DEP, and other things. It doesn't show much actually on this property right now. Oh, it's still drawing. Um, yeah, so you know, I, I think it could be worthwhile, but I'm not sure I would assume that there's a lot of potential there. And then I was going to circle back to the gateway comment. Yeah, I mean, I did mention it. I do think that. The gateway area is actually a really great way to connect downtown and UMass and have some additional vibrancy with mixed use, retail, commercial, um, you know, those types of uses. I don't think it need, I don't, I'm not advocating for a massive building like they're doing now, but having, you know, allowing some, some infill and development there. I don't, you know, right now it's, there's a, some vacant lots and there's some aging buildings and I think there's an opportunity before people start reinvesting in things that, you know, if we really do want to have retail and commercial businesses that are viable, we need to have more density in the village centers. And so, you know, if, if we can get people off campus and walking to downtown to support stores and retail, then I think that's a location to do it. Um, again, I like the idea of design guidelines and really working with that. But, you know, when we, when Atkins moved to North Amherst, you know, they had ideas that they wanted in terms of number of parking spaces, you know, density within the area and a number of things. And so, you know, if the co-op is interested in whether it's, you know, the housing production plan showed on the corner of Triangle Street and 
um, East Pleasant, but or Maplewood you were talking about, I mean, I think some of it would be what I'd, I'd be curious to know what are the kind of the parameters that co-op is looking for and does Maplewood meet it? Or if we rezone some areas in East Amherst, is there the possibility that that would be attractive to them? Again, I, you know, I don't know what they're looking for in terms of parking or bus routes or size square foot they need. Um, but yeah, anyway, so I'm, you know, I'm jumping around, but I do like, I like the idea of East Amherst and I do like the idea still of looking at where can we, you know, you know, I, right now too, taxes, you know, increasing taxes can be important. So if, if we allow all development to happen on UMass and students stay on campus, UMass is doing a great job of keeping students on campus with their food services and other things. And in the new, in the new building going up, they're having, you know, rock climbing and things for students to do. And so, you know, I think for the, the health of the downtown, I mean, it'd be great to get students and, and visitors in downtown with other, other things to do. So whether that's more restaurants, if there's a billiards, if there's, you know, just other live entertainment that could happen that's for students and non-students alike. I think that we just need to get, we need to be able to have the density and the people that can support that. Thanks. Thank you, Nate. Uh, Andrew. Thanks, Doug. Um, I guess sort of back to the comment before that, that Tom was leading um, relative to sort of working groups, I'm, I, I will raise my hand. I'm more than happy to, uh, to, to help and be part of like a two person team, um, with, you know, being able to help refine maybe the boundaries of where this, you know, these changes might occur. I had a, a question for Chris would be, um, could we use your plotter? Right, so like I can produce some maps, we can do some charrette stuff, like we can produce, get some stuff done and then maybe do some sort of markup here. So um, yeah, I, I'd be very interested in helping on that front. I agree with the design review and I know that Janet's mentioned that as well. Um, and it, it's almost sounded like maybe there's a couple of small pairs of people, like a group that could focus maybe on where, another group that could maybe focus on the design and that we could do some work in parallel and, and bring that together in a, a time frame that aligns with uh, resources. So I'll, I'll put that out uh, uh, as a volunteer. And then um, I was curious also, I've not seen the Wayfinder's design, but if we're thinking about extending BBC and maybe even leapfrogging that, is a Wayfinder's design, would it, would it complement a BBC or would it sort of go against it in which case, even if we extend BBC, it still sort of feels like spot zone. Does that make sense? So again, I haven't seen yeah, it. I think there's there, there's actually different strategies for how to loosen things. I mean, one is obviously the overlay. One is to just take B, BBC and extend it, but BBC may not be quite right for this spot. A third way would be to take COM and yeah. modify COM or, you know, or do an overlay, I think, I mean, is probably the, the simplest way, because then you don't have to go into the zoning code and figure out everything that's affected by whatever you're trying to do. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I agree that that's simpler. I, I wonder, is it, would it ultimately, I guess, does it become more convoluted? Is it a Band-Aid, yeah. right? And, and in terms of, I know we've, we've talked in this board about uh, at least, you know, I shouldn't say maybe we've talked about it, but I think we've talked about sort of wanting to to present ourselves as open for business, right? And and we've heard about some of like the onerous zoning and just the complexity and is is an overlay. I just don't know. Would it make it easier or is it like another thing to sort out? So, um, but that said, I yeah, I I've been talking about BBC, but yeah, maybe it's calm. Maybe maybe it's a couple different scenarios. Uh, again, I'm I'm happy to mock some stuff up, and if we have access to a plotter, I can I can put some things out there for us to consume. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Tom, you uh, Chris. I just wanted to say yes, we do have access to a plotter. So if someone gets me an electronic version of something, I can get it drawn up. Okay. Tom. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, I think Andrew. What, you know, thing about simplicity. What I was thinking about when we were tackling this particular area 
was as a case study or as an example for something that could be deployed on Pomeroy and elsewhere. So it's a set of principles and values. So I, for me, I'd much rather see an overlay that can then get overlaid in other places around or something that was more strategic that could be redeployed so that we could have kind of um, something already in place. And all we have to do is reset boundaries in, in these different areas and we can just kind of plop it elsewhere. So we understand how the design guidelines might work in that zone. We understand, um, you know, the, the scale, size, and um, usages that are allowed, and then we can just pop that around where we where we want because we have multiple village centers. We're trying to focus on in the longer term. So, well, I mean, in this case, it's comms, but elsewhere it's not calm, right? So, like, if we went in and refined calm here, then we'd have to then turn another zone into calm, and then and so you, which you could, could do, we could do also, yeah. 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 Right. Okay. So different strategies by whomever is motivated to work on them. Karen. Yeah. And in the meantime, if those of us that want to really move on one area and make a change that isn't long term, um, I propose that we really zero in on this Maplewood farm and get that place going. Um, I don't know how you're right, you have to talk to the owner, but that's a doable thing. That's a defined thing. And that would make such a difference while we're working on a long term for the town, because it's really so imperative that we get a, a good food place in the center of town as fast as possible, I think. Andrew. Real fast, thanks, Doug. Uh, I, I don't know how long Maple Line has been vacant. I know it's a long time, but I imagine that might be a, a raise and rebuild type of scenario, not a retrofit. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, but I, I like it, it seems like a great thing we can just turn back on. I, I don't know if we can or not. It might actually be more difficult to have someone yeah. redevelop. One way would be, Karen, if, if you're, you could check with the owner. Yeah. Like, where are they at? Are they even interested in this anymore? Well, you, you're a private citizen. You can look them up on the property card and the, the address of the owner is there. I mean, you're speaking as a person. You're not speaking for the planning board, so. <laughs> All right, so we've, we're, it's now about 8.35, 8.35, and it seems like we're winding down a little bit in terms of what we wanted to do together tonight. Is that true, Andrew? I see your hand. Um, so we do have two ANRs that the staff wanted to get in front of us to have us discuss, and uh, I, had, I had mentioned earlier that I thought maybe if we tried to finish by nine, so... Uh, maybe we can wrap this up soon and then do the ANRs. Andrew. Thanks, Doug. Um, the, the only thing that I'm wondering, I think we ended up having this session because of the third Wednesday in March, right? Is that, that's why we're able to, that's why we're We've, we fit it in to, without pushing other business away. Do we know if there's a similar, op I mean, the, this, I've loved these, uh, these two face-to-face -face, uh, in-person meetings and being able to get very tactical. Is this something that we actually, within the planning board's schedule, is there another opportunity to have one of these? We, or we, is it we can look for, for another one soon. Um, I don't, I haven't looked at the April calendar. I don't know if there is a fifth Wednesday. Yeah, I doubt um, there is. But at least recently, our, our, sort of obligatory business has been less pressing than it was certainly most of last year. So we can look for, you know, whether we could do it on a first or third Wednesday, take, take an hour and a half, you know, just sort of do the minimal that we have to do and then have another conversation like this then. That, that, that would be fantastic. So I think for me partly to keep the momentum going, Keeping momentum um, and time boxing yeah. so that 
you know, if folks are going to do stuff, they have a date that they can uh, target. Right. And I was also curious, and I know I missed the last meeting, whether, Bruce, I know you had a very ambitious um, kind of side project you were working on in terms of reaching out to communities, whether if I missed the update, uh, that's on me, but. We haven't, we haven't heard the update. Okay. And I, it's a lot, so I don't mean to um, push that on you. I was just very excited. So uh, thank you, Andrew. Bruce. Um, I just want to say I agree with you, Andrew. I think these are really very positive. I, I, I like them for a couple of reasons. One, the first reason is I like, uh, I like being able to sit across the table and, and talk to people, and uh, it's much more intimate, and therefore I think it's more productive. Certainly that's true for me. And so I would, uh, I would commit time to doing this. And uh, the first one we did was not on an off Wednesday. It was a, it was a Tuesday. It was a Tuesday. Right? Yeah. And uh, so I just want to remind us that uh, certainly from my point of view, I can make myself available on other than Wednesdays, particularly for um, sitting around a table like this. I really don't like that. Um, uh, as far as my little passion project is concerned, I've been away for a month in the Bahamas and I didn't do too many phone calls. I did zero, and also I missed last meeting too because I got blown out by a not quite a hurricane, but it was a pretty strong winds, and and uh, I I only got a the first part of the meeting, which is why I was logged into this damn thing. And then when I saw the town room come up, I thought, oh, <laughs> I'm in the wrong place. So uh, I don't know too much about what happened last time either, but I'm, I'm continuing I, uh, with my little project. I'm about to get back into doing the, the next step, which is to make those 30 or 40 calls. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Okay, um, maybe for this evening, we'll end, that, end this topic. And um, Pam or Chris, do you want to talk about the a and rs the time now is 8 39 and uh pam i assume you can bring the a and rs up on the screen or you cannot okay so we'll need to try to describe them as accurately as we can for the recording and for the public who are are listening So do you, do you want to, well, it was, it was in the packet. Yeah, they were, they were in the packet. I looked at them before the, yes, they, they were, they're on the packet. All right, you got them all. All right, so Tom is sharing the screen. And yes, yes. So Chris, why don't you introduce this first one? So this is actually a um, property on Old Montague Road. Montague Road is to the right and Old Montague Road is the curved road to the left. Um, there are two properties here and the, the property to the south is one that has not been developed yet. It's outlined in yellow. The property to the north, outlined in blue, has been developed. Property to the north was developed prior to there being a requirement for a um, building circle on each property. So um, the idea here is to um, 
allow the property to the south to be developed by uh, um, creating a space where they could have a building circle. So uh, both properties will be uh, of a size that they need to be in order to, um, so Pam, can you bring those over? So those are the ones that- Chris, do you want Tom to go to the second? So there's, there's the oh, thing, there's, there's, there's the yeah. same property. That's good, yeah. And there's that little corner that's being removed from one. Yeah, than... so here you can see it well. So the corner is being um, removed. And then the strip along, the strip to the north, which is to the right. The strip to the is right being is being transferred in exchange for that triangle. Yes. That's to right. the northern property. Yeah. So that allows the southern property to have the building circle. And the northern property doesn't need it because it was uh, already developed before the building circle was required. So the building commissioner has looked at this. He doesn't see any problems with it. It has the appropriate amount of lot area and frontage. And it's just a question of whether you will authorize the chair to sign this as not a, a subdivision. Doesn't require a subdivision uh, plan. Uh, Bruce? Um, it, it looks like that uh, what was the yellow property is uh, uh, in addition to that uh, slice off the blue property, the yellow property is uh, is divided at the uh, left hand side of the circle. So now there are three parcels, not two. Yes, that's right. I, I think... don't think it affects my oh, willingness yeah. to, to support the chair, but I just like to know that we've actually got a third parcel a third there, parcel so. that is already developed there's a house on that parcel i think there's a duplex on it and oh, so um it doesn't oh oh it doesn't show here because it was developed after this aerial okay oh wait 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 no the duplex is the one that you can see right there that pink building yeah. okay that's it okay so do you understand what's it's happening maybe we should have kind of it doesn't it doesn't look like what the other drawing was it's the other maybe the property line's been moved yes you see that's it's, it's been squidged over a bit yeah I, th I i i i don't think i need to know anymore i do see what you mean that that vertical line that's that vertical line looks like a property line it is a and that so that makes that parcel different than it shows in the previous slide. Oh, in the colored slide? Yeah. In the colored slide, the yellow boundary goes farther south. That's correct. So the 2A36 parcel looks like it extends. Yeah. So there's something funny about that. That's our GIS, and that's not really official. This was just to get you oriented to where this is located. Okay. To give you a general impression. Yeah. So this is what's really being proposed. And there is a condominium here. You can see old Montague Road condominium on that property. And there's a house here. So do you All authorize right. the chair to sign this plan as not a subdivision? So what we usually do is sort of an informal consensus rather than voting a roll call. And I'm seeing hands from all four other members here tonight so i think we have the consensus for me to meet you behind the building some afternoon you Chris. could do it here tonight oh we i can do it here you've got, plans you've got and everything oh one of the one of the benefits of being in person <laughs> <laughs> okay all right so that was the first one and then there's one more the second one is the building or the project the that i've been yellow. talking about on and off it is the property that the town purchased with uh, CPAC money. And um, it's going to, it's three properties. I think it was formerly owned by Keith Kinetic. And uh, the town purchased the property for the purpose of creating affordable housing here. So this property, the three properties are going to be combined into one lot. And it's listed here as lot A. It's 115,418 square feet. It currently has two houses on it, and those houses are going to be either raised or taken elsewhere. Um, and then this is going to be developed by Wayfinders as part of the affordable housing development that includes the East Street School. So this combined with East Street, I think, is going to 
result in about 70 units, some of, uh, many of which are going to be affordable, some of which are going to be market rate. And so again, you'll be uh, authorizing the chair to sign this plan on behalf of the planning board and attesting basically to the fact that there's no subdivision required here. Okay. Um, looks like everybody's fine with that too. Can I, Chris, ask you um, on at least one of the recent development proposals that came to the planning board for site plan review, um, it was the site strategy was established when by the time it got to us for site plan review. And since this is a town project, is there any opportunity for the planning board to see the project earlier when you're sort of working out the site strategy rather than so late that everything's totally baked? I think that the site strategy has been worked out by Wayfinders already. Um, it's going to be going before the Zoning Board of Appeals for a permit. It will come to the Planning Board for your review and recommendations, but I think they're too far along to, for you to have much input at this point. Okay. Um, I mean, you can have input about some of the details, but essentially the building, the way they had initially designed it was to have the building farther back and have all the parking in front. And we told them we didn't really like that. That wasn't a, in keeping with the, the idea of a village center. So the, they've moved the building forward and the parking is in back. It's kind of challenging because there is a big wetland in back. So they had, they didn't, they don't actually have that much room to work, to work with. But we will be bringing it to you, but I'm not sure what. Um, okay. But it sounds like you and the developer have already had some conversations yes. and yes. You've, you've, the planning staff at least has had some input on that. Planning staff, conservation staff, and building commissioner have had input into this new plan. Okay. And so has the town manager, okay. by the way. All right. So good. Okay. All right. So that's it for the two ANRs. The time now is 8.49. Um, I don't think we have anything else on it that's allowed on our agenda. Um, so unless anybody has anything else they want to say, we can be adjourned. Are we good? All right, we are adjourned. See you all the first week of April, which is next week. Oh, you want to, Chris, why don't you grab the microphone? Okay, so... Um... What happened? Um, the, first, the planning board meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, which oh, yeah. is th April 5th. And we have determined that April 5th is the first night of Passover. And we've been encouraged not to hold meetings on holy days like that. So um, we're going to be canceling that meeting, but Doug and I need to appear uh, remotely, I guess. We'll open the meeting and then close it. We need to move the public hearing that was continued to the 5th. If you'll remember the uh, proposal to change the zoning, having to do with duplexes, et cetera, we started the public hearing on March 1st, continued it to April 5th, not realizing that that was the first night of Passover. So now Doug and I will be meeting on the 5th to continue it again to April 19th. So we will, so, so. I don't think so. I think we can just say, well, we don't have a quorum because it's Passover. So we are going to continue it again to the 19th. Okay. So I, we okay. won't see all of you next no. week. We'll see each other on the 19th. Okay. And you and I are going to do that by Zoom? By Zoom. Yeah. That's okay, Pam? Okay. Pam is going to help us. All Pam right. is going to run the show. So that should be one of the shortest meetings ever. I hope so. <laughs> yes. All right. Great. <laughs> I don't know that we're even going to ask <laughs> for any. Well, if you don't have a quorum, you can't take public comment. So okay. No testimony without a quorum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I don't no. think, I don't think can't you, meet. you and me. No. In general. We yeah. go home. All right, time is 8.51 and we are adjourned. We can stop the recording and turn off the microphones.